All right, everyone, get ready for a deep dive. We're taking a close look at pulsed field deblation, or PFA for short, and how it's shaking things up in the world of atrial fibrillation treatment. It's pretty exciting stuff. You know, atrial fibrillation, or AFib as it's often called, can really impact people's lives. And PFA is showing a lot of promise, particularly when it comes to safety. So let's start with the basics. What exactly is PFA, and how does it work its magic on those irregular heart rhythms? Well, the current standard treatment, thermal ablation, uses heat or cold to basically zap those wonky electrical signals in the heart. Right, we've talked about that before. Yeah, and while it's effective, it also carries a risk of damaging surrounding tissues. Kind of like using a blowtorch to fix a tiny leak, right? Exactly, you risk damaging the whole pipe, so to speak. Okay, so where does PFA fit into all of this? PFA takes a completely different approach. It uses these incredibly fast electrical pulses, think microsecond bursts, to create tiny pores in the targeted cells. So instead of burning or freezing, it's more like poking holes. That's a great way to put it. And because the damage is so localized, the surrounding tissues are basically left unharmed. So less collateral damage, more precision targeting. Hmm. Got it. But let's be real, no medical procedure is completely risk-free. What did the Manifest 17K study reveal about PFA's safety profile? Okay, so Manifest 17K was huge. Over 17,000 patients across 106 centers. It's the largest study we have on PFA in a real-world setting. And you know what? The results were impressive. Give me the highlights. Remember those big concerns with thermal ablation, like esophageal complications? Uh -huh. mm. Things like pulmonary vein stenosis uh. or phrenic nerve injury? Yeah, serious stuff. Well, none of those showed up in this study. That's remarkable. Right. I mean, avoiding those complications alone is a major win for PFA. Absolutely. But, and there's always a but, right? Right. There are always some risks. Exactly. It's not a free lunch, but the overall rate of major complications was about 1%. Okay, 1%. That's pretty low. But let's break it down. What were the most common complications they saw? Pericardial tamponade was one. Pericardial. Remind me what that is again. Yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful. Basically, it's when fluid builds up around the heart, which puts pressure on it and makes it harder to pump. Okay, so fluid buildup around the heart. Is that specific to PFA or can it happen with other heart procedures too? It can happen with any heart procedure. It's not unique to PFA, but it is something to be aware of. And how often did it happen in this study? Anything we can do to lower the risk. The rate was about 0.36%, and thankfully, most cases were treated successfully with a fairly straightforward procedure. Imagine using a needle to drain the excess fluid. Makes sense. Anything else they could do during the procedure to minimize the risk? Absolutely. Careful catheter manipulation, using imaging guidance, those things go a long way in prevention. Okay, so steady hands and a keen eye. Exactly. You mentioned vascular complications were also common? Yeah, that's another one. I'm guessing that's mainly related to the catheter insertion site, right? You got it. We're talking about the groin area, typically. Mm -hmm. About 2.2% of patients had some type of vascular complication. Most of them were minor, though, and didn't require any further intervention. Okay, good to know. Anything else about those vascular complications worth highlighting? Well, the study found something interesting. Centers that routinely used ultrasound guidance during vascular access, you know, when they insert the catheters, yeah. they had significantly lower rates of major vascular complications. So ultrasound guidance, check. Makes sense. Okay, we've covered the most common complications. What about those unexpected ones? You know, the curveballs they didn't really see coming. Ah, uh, yes, there were a couple of those. Shows you we're still learning about this technology. What surprised them? One was coronary spasm. Okay, break that down for me. What exactly is coronary spasm? Imagine it like a sudden cramp in the arteries that supply blood to your heart. Oh. Ouch. Yeah, it can cause chest pain and in some cases even trigger a dangerous heart rhythm called ventricular fibrillation. Sounds serious. It is. It happened in about 0.14% of patients in the study. So, not super common, but definitely something to keep in mind. Was it always directly related to the PFA procedure itself? Not necessarily. They actually found two types of spasm. One was what they called proximity-related, meaning it happened near the coronary arteries while they were doing the ablation. Makes sense. And the other was what they called generalized spasm, which could happen anywhere in the heart. Hmm. Interesting. Mm. Anything they could do to manage that. Most of the time, nitroglycerin was effective. Nitroglycerin, what does that do? It helps to relax and widen the blood vessels, which is what you want in that situation. Okay, so nitroglycerin on hand, just in case. Exactly. But you mentioned ventricular fibrillation. Did any of those coronary spasm cases actually lead to that? There were two cases where it did happen. Those patients required resuscitation. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
Both patients recovered, thankfully. It's good to hear. But it definitely underscores the importance of recognizing this as a potential complication and taking steps to minimize the risk, of course. Absolutely. You mentioned there was another unexpected complication they saw. Right. Hemolysis. That's when red blood cells break down. Okay. In rare cases, it can overload the kidneys and lead to acute renal failure. Oh, wow. How often did that happen? It was very rare. Only five patients out of over 17,000. Okay, so a tiny fraction. Tiny, but still concerning. All five of those patients needed temporary dialysis, but the good news is that they all recovered. Okay, well, that's reassuring. Yeah. Any insights into what might have caused it or how they could prevent it in the future? Well, what they noticed was that all five of those cases involved a higher than average number of PFA applications during the procedure. So potentially a dose-related effect. Possibly. It definitely raises some interesting questions. Yeah, more research is needed. Exactly. Yeah. But for now, it might be wise to minimize the number of PFA applications if possible. Makes sense. Less is more, right? <laughs> Potentially. Wow. We've covered a lot of ground already, and we've only just scratched the surface of this fascinating new technology. Let's take a moment to let all of this sink in for everyone. Yeah, good idea. You know, it's really interesting to see how PFA is changing what we can do in cardiac care. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, like we were talking about, it's still pretty new. Yeah. We're still figuring things out as we go. Right. It's not like we have decades of data like we do with thermal ablation. Exactly. And, you know, one of the most encouraging things about the Manifest 17K study yeah. is that it shows a clear learning curve. Oh, that's true. As more procedures are done, yeah. doctors are getting better and better at it. It's, it's practice makes perfect. Precisely. And, you know... What they saw was a significant drop in key complications. Right. Like pericardial tamponade and stroke. Oh, wow. Between like the early adopters and now? Yeah. When they compared the initial group of experienced PFA centers to the larger Manifest 17K study. Okay. Yeah. So experience really does matter. Absolutely. Especially with a new technology like this. It's like anything else. The more you do it, the better you get. Exactly. And here's something else that's really interesting. Okay. They also compared those experience centers to newer centers. Okay. So like the newbies? Yeah. The ones just starting to use PFA. Gotcha. And guess what? What? The complication rates were surprisingly similar between the two groups. Wait, really? So the newer centers were performing just as well as the experienced ones? It seems that way. That's impressive. It is. I mean, what does that tell us about PFA and how it's being adopted? I think it shows that the medical community is doing a great job of sharing knowledge. Right. So those early lessons learned are being passed along. Exactly. And that's leading to better outcomes for patients. Right from the start. Yes. That's fantastic. Yeah. So it's not just a few experts who are getting good results. Yeah. It's more like PFA is coming with a built-in safety net because everyone's learning from each other. That's a great way to put it. And as the technology continues to evolve, yeah. that safety net will only get stronger. I love that. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the potential complications with PFA. We have both the expected ones and those unexpected curveballs. But for our listener out there who might be considering PFA for atrial fibrillation, yeah, what's the big takeaway here? Well, I think it's clear that PFA is a very promising alternative to thermal ablation. Okay. Avoiding those major complications like esophageal damage and pulmonary vein stenosis, that's huge. Huge. It's like a breath of fresh air for people with AFib. It really is. They're looking for a safer, more targeted treatment option. Absolutely. But as we've discussed, no procedure is without risk. Right. We still need to be mindful of those rarer complications. We do. Things like coronary spasm and hemolysis. Yes. And that's where having a good conversation with your doctor comes in. Absolutely. Every patient is different. Right. The best treatment approach will depend on your overall health, uh -huh. how severe your AFib is, and your tolerance for risk. Risk. It's all about finding that balance. It's about personalized medicine. Exactly. So to our listener out there, knowledge is power. Do your research, ask questions, and don't be afraid to advocate for yourself. I agree. If PFA is something you're considering, have a candid conversation with your doctor. Yes. Talk about the benefits and the risks. Make sure you understand everything. Absolutely. And remember, medical science is always evolving. PFA is a perfect example of that. It really is. So stay informed, stay engaged, and stay hopeful. Because there are some very exciting advancements happening all the time. That's a great point. Now, before we wrap up this deep dive, yeah. I want to leave our listener with something to think about. Okay. We've seen that PFA is already showing a remarkable safety profile. 
It is. Especially yeah. compared to thermal ablation. Right. But as the technology continues to advance and doctors gain even more experience, yeah. what steps could we take to further reduce the risk of those rare complications? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Can we get those numbers even lower? I think that's what researchers are working on right now. Yeah. New catheter designs refined energy delivery protocols. Even personalized risk assessments based on individual patient characteristics. Wow. All of these things could play a role in making PFA even safer. So to our listener, stay curious, stay engaged, and stay tuned. The future of PFA is looking bright, and we'll be right here with you every step of the way. Exploring the latest and greatest in medical innovation. Exactly. You know, it's incredible when you think about it. What's that? All the work that goes into developing a new technology like oh, this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We've talked about the science, the benefits, mm -hmm. even some of the challenges they've encountered. Right. But for me, it's the human element that really stands out. The human element. Yeah, the doctors and the researchers. Oh, yeah. And, of course, the patients. Of course. All these people working together to shape the future of cardiac care. It's pretty remarkable when you think about it that way. It really is. But let's bring it back down to earth for a second. I, for our listener who's maybe on the fence about PFA, what are the key things they should be thinking about? Well, I think the most important thing to remember is that while PFA is showing a lot of promise, mm -hmm. it's still a relatively new technology. Right. We have this great data from the Manifest 17K study yeah. showing that it's safe, right. but we're still learning about the long-term outcome. It's not like thermal ablation, which has been around for ages. Exactly. We have a much longer track record with that. Yeah. So it really comes down to weighing the potential benefits of PFA mm -hmm. against those unknowns. Right. And that's where having an open and honest conversation with your doctor is so important. Couldn't agree more. They can help you assess your individual risk factors. Yeah. Talk about your treatment goals. Right. And figure out if PFA is the right fit for you. So to our listener out there, yeah, be an active participant in your health journey. Absolutely. Ask questions. Do your research. Don't be afraid to speak up. Yeah. Advocate for yourself. Exactly. Knowledge is power. Especially when it comes to your health. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground today. I think so, too. We've explored PFA from all angles. We have. From how it works to its safety profile. Uh-huh. And even those potential complications. Right. And I think we've highlighted how important it is to stay informed. Absolutely. Keep learning and stay engaged with your health. As this technology keeps evolving. Exactly. Well, that's a wrap for today's deep dive into pulsed field ablation. It's been a fascinating journey. It really has. To our listener, we hope you found this exploration insightful and helpful. We hope it empowers you to make informed decisions about your health. And remember, the quest for knowledge never ends. You get asking questions. Stay curious and stay engaged with your health. Until next time, take care of those amazing hearts of yours. <laughs>